and here we are. It is the Rhythm of War audiobook conversation. Uh, we'll go ahead and do some some introductions again before we get to our esteemed guests. Uh, if you are unfamiliar with me, I work in the gaming space, mostly in esports, interviewing uh, people uh, who compete professionally uh, in those games, but really excited today to be doing uh, a different set of interviews. Uh, and I'll go ahead and let Mark go ahead and introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Mark Zerman. I work uh, primarily with Riot Games, working on the League of Legends uh, LCS broadcast. We just wrapped Worlds. Uh, and so for happy hour, I am drinking a blood orange mimosa that they sent to us because everything's remote this year. They couldn't throw an after party. Um, and so this is this is what I got. Travis, did you get a drink? Or, yes, or no? I was going to say, uh, welcome Michael and, and Kate. And thank you guys for officially declaring this to be a happy hour interview. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I am drinking a, a mango cart beer, but if both of you would like to introduce yourselves and let us know what you're drinking, we'd love to hear. I'm Kate Redding and I'm drinking Jack Daniels. Um, I'm Michael Kramer, and I'm out of scotch, so I'm also drinking Jack Daniels. <laughs> you are both way classier than, than we can handle. Uh, no, nothing classy about it. It's yes. just... Very good. And uh, so for those that uh, do not know, uh, you are the narrators on Rhythm of War, but not just on Rhythm of War, but across so many uh, countless books, both in, in the Brandon Sanderson world and many others. Um, but yeah, I mean, maybe... Maybe you guys would both be better at, at introducing yourselves and sort of your, your history in the space than I would be. Uh, okay. Um, we've been doing audiobooks for almost 30 years. Um, and middle 90s, early 90s, we started doing the Wheel of Time series, which was how we got introduced to Brandon um, when he took over to finish the series. Um, before he finished the series, we, or I should say I, uh, ended up doing the first trilogy of the Mistborn series, which he had written. And then um, we did the final volume, which was three volumes of Wheel of Time uh, together. And then uh, have since launched into um, the Stormlight Archive, and this is release of book four. Well, very, very exciting. How many of these are, are you guys doing? Because it definitely feels like, I mean, we were just talking with Brandon, uh, audio books. Oh, yeah, I'm so sorry, Kate. I should, I, if, if you would like to extend, I know, I know Michael kind of did the introductions for both of you, but if there's any, anything you would like to add on to that introduction. No, I mean, that's, that's our history, which is, uh, relevant to Robert Jordan and Brandon yeah. Sanderson yeah. and how we kind of became his go-to people um, because Brandon finished the Wheel of Time series after Robert Jordan passed away. And that was really when we sort of got to know him. And didn't you do something of his for no, the did, Library I, of Congress? Um, I did the Mistborn series commercially, um, both the initial trilogy and three of the, what is now uh, uh, the second generation, three of the first, it was supposed to be a trilogy, but it's actually four books. Um, I did The Rhythmatist, um, and then for the Library of Congress Talking Books program, which is only available um, to the blind and print disabled, although there is a commercial recording out, which I understand is quite good. I did Warbreaker as well. So I, I'm very familiar with a lot of the Cosmere world yeah. um, through him. Well, I, I will just say, you know, I was, as you can tell, I was jumping ahead of myself a little bit there. I, I consume the books entirely via audio. So uh, your voices are, I've, I've heard many, many times. And, and I think, uh, you know, the, the question I was getting at was just um, how, how many of these, these interviews and, um, you know, as, as the book comes out, do you start, are you finding that you are doing more of these and uh, getting a little bit more notoriety? Because we were just talking to Brandon and it seems like, the audiobook space is just kind of blowing up completely and more and more people are, are listening to these books on audio. Yes, uh, I think especially um, in conjunction with the launch of Rhythm of War, we're being asked to do a number of interviews and speak on podcasts and panels and things like that, which is why we are using that as an opportunity to fundraise for Books to Prisoners, which is the charity that we support. 
in our capacity as audiobook narrators. Yeah, no, I, I, I definitely want to ask you, you both about that in, in just a couple moments uh, before we, we get into spoilers, because I was really excited to hear about that. But Mark, I know I've been, I've been hogging a little bit. Uh, do you, you want to throw anything out there? Yeah, I mean, this is one that's just been, I, it self, sounds so funny, but like, Obviously, you guys are in people's ears for thousands of, you know, hundreds of hours at this point with how long these books are and stuff and millions of readers. You're definitely, I think, celebrities. And like Travis was saying, like you're, you're like this earworm almost to people. I was wondering in that vein with how, how big audiobooks are now, do people ever recognize you off your voice? Do you ever like drive up to a Starbucks and you ask for like a Frappuccino and mm. someone's like, is that Shalon? Or, you know, do you ever get these kinds of recognize, like, you know, a telemarketer calls and then they're like, wait a minute, does you ever get anything like that? I have once. It's rare because, um, but yeah, every now and again, someone will say, hold it. I, I know that voice. I know that, yeah. Because <laughs> if they've listened to like Wheel of Time or, or this series, um, you know, that's, well, Wheel of Time, I think, is close to 500 hours, and and uh, with Rhythm of War, this series will be close to 200 hours. Um, but it's not like you're going up to Starbucks and saying, right. "Could I have yeah. a cup of tea?" <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. What's your story, uh, Kate, on get on getting recognized? Was it a a funny one or just a, a small thing? No, it was actually, it was really sobering because I called to complain about something. <laughs> and I'm, I, I'm very impatient and I can be really mean, um, especially on the phone, especially when I feel like hard done by. And so I had this edge to my voice and then it turned out that the person <laughs> recognized me <laughs> as one of the narrators. And so I had to like dial it way back. <laughs> That's that's incredible. I I really it's it's crazy to hear that. I I later on in this interview, I definitely want to ask more questions about sort of the books and have a bit more of a spoiler conversation. Um, but I mean, what what has it been like for for both of you? I mean, we, I know we're kind of uh, beating around the bush on this, but like on just the growth of of audio and and having so many people come to know you as these voices. And I think you know, I know you probably gained a following, especially around the Wheel of Time uh, situation. Uh, but just, it feels like every year there must be more and more people who are learning more about you and becoming fans. Well, it, it's, it's, I mean, audiobooks have just become so ubiquitous and so many more people listen to them now than did 30 years ago. 30 years ago, it was like this little niche then. And only a small number of people really listened. So what's been interesting for us is the sort of learning curve of figuring out how to manage kind of being on social media, making ourselves accessible to people. Um, we redesigned our website so that we could add like independent authors can fill out a form to contact us if they want to hire us to read their book. But all of that is like, uh, when we started, it was landlines. Like, that's it. Rotary. <laughs> Almost rotary Ro phone. Yeah, rotary. <laughs> I mean, the technology has changed it because in the old days, you have to, you, we were using reel-to-reels. There was almost virtually no editing available. Um, so you had to be pretty close to word perfect the way, you know, through, because you couldn't go in and cut and splice tape because your tape had to be transferred to a cassette, which needed to be transferred to a high speed duplication, which needed to go onto small cassettes, which needed to be packed into cardboard boxes, which needed to be ordered via mail or, you know, some 800 phone line. Um, and, you know, it would be potentially five days to two weeks before you actually got the book, if it was in stock, because, you know, this is a popular book. And, you know, that we only made 300 copies of it, so 300 are out. We're waiting for one to come back. Hopefully it'll come back without being destroyed. Um, to now it's, what, five clicks yeah. uh, on Audible, and it can be downloaded to whatever device. And the device is not just, you know, a portable cassette. M mind you, 
when we started, there was no such thing as a portable cassette player. Oh my God, don't tell them how old you <laughs> Oh, I did my research. I, I saw it when you guys got your start. It, 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 I mean, you basically, it was, you know, you're, you're, once they put a cassette player in the car, that's when audiobooks kind of, yeah. that was the first major step in terms of marketing. Yeah. Um, but, you know, now what? Your, iP your iPod, your phone, you know, your whatever you want to, you know, um, yeah, you have it. Pretty soon there'll be a chip in your head where all you do is, you know, bite it down hard three times in the left molar and bang, it's already, <laughs> you know. Is that something you're preparing and other, for? <laughs> and the other thing is we, we, we've both worked for the Library of Congress Talking Books for the Blind and Print Disabled for many, many years. So we have a following in that community as well. And then in terms of genres, we've both done practically all the genres. So sometimes your following can be very genre specific. Yeah. I have like, like a niche period British historical romance <laughs> world. And there are people that follow me in that world or historical biography, your Raoul Wallenberg and those kind of books. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's, what, what I find so hilarious is, is uh, we've been doing some independent books. We've been producing public domain books just because we like to choose the material. And I recorded Lytton Strachey's Queen Victoria. It's a biography that was written about 10 years after she died. And it's a fascinating book. He was not a fan of the Queen. So it's really hilarious and biting. And the number of fantasy fans who are also into historical biography is I would love to do, draw a Venn diagram of, of all the fans and the different genres that they love to see where the overlaps are because it's, um, it's wide open. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think uh, it's really interesting to talk about, you know, the, the history of it. Someone in, we're live and so we can get chat from people and someone asks uh, a question that I think is interesting is I know you guys record in your, your basement now. Um, but how is like the technology changed? Like, was that, were you always like, when you talked about ordering all these supplies and how, how difficult it was, were you still recording uh, yourself or were you going to studios and now you can, you can uh, just do it all from home? And do you miss some of the getting out there, especially now with, with Corona and the current situation with COVID-19 and everything? Like, how has that kind of growth gone with the technology? Well, originally, yeah. Uh... We started out not in our own, even in studios in other people's homes, but basically uh, much more complicated. Nowadays, part of it is, you know, you can record on a laptop um, and a good, you know, with a good mic setup. Um, and you can, you know, in the old days, because you were recording on uh, reel to reel, a lot of the noises that in the background didn't matter because the tape hiss was so loud. It was like you're listening to a story in a blizzard. Um, uh, now it's like, oh, there's, you know, it's a bit like, well, let's go in and take out that little tick. The light, the yeah. light made a little tick at that point, you know, yeah. for some reason. Um, I mean, I think the sequence is kind of, you were at Flo Gibson's on Reel to Reel. Right. And then we were at Grover Gardner's right. um, home where he had three booths set up. Right. Right. And that was when we were on DAT tape yeah. and then ADAT, which I still have nightmares about. Mm-hmm. And we did the first studio that we built in this house, which we bought um, in 97, was we were using ADAT. And then we started to use computers once the software was developed. So I still upstairs, because I'm a hoarder, I still have the Mac Dome computer that was our <laughs> first recording computer. <laughs> right. And, um... With regard to that, I mean, we used to get, you would get everything to get the actual books. And initially it was uh, audio books came out about three to six months after the print book came out. Um, and then they realized, hey, we can take advantage of all the print publicity when we launch the audio book. And also now with audio books being so popular, it's like, who wants to wait? It's like, you know, walking around the office. No, 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 no. Don't talk to me. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, the book yet you can't you know don't give me any spoilers 
Well, they want to be able to, everybody wants to be able to talk about the book when, when it's released, like Rhythm of War. You know that mm -hmm. for three days, no one's going to be doing any, no one's going to show up at the office because that's 55 hours uh, or actually more than that. Um, so, uh, so then they, they pushed, you know, up the production uh, days and we used to have, but, but in the old days before iPads and, and electronic transfer of files, we would get shows of the galleys so single you know single-sided one page um, and by the end of the year we would have a stack of paper that almost went to the ceiling every year um, because you're getting that many you know copies and then god forbid there would be a new version that came out when you're halfway through it's like okay take that three inches of paper and put it over here and now remove this three inches of paper into what you're doing um FedEx lost so much yeah. income <laughs> to using software yeah. because when we were on that, we would have to burn CDs right. and then use FedEx to ship them to California or wherever the company was. Mm -hmm. And now, I mean, I remember the first time I was like, wait, what? I just click and you have it? Did you get it? You have it? Yeah. Did it work? Yeah. I couldn't believe right. it. It's not going away. Uh -huh. Well, uh, Kate, Kate, you kind of hinted at this at the start, but you you're both working it on a on a really cool initiative um, that I would love to hear hear more about that you you said you're kind of talking about in these these interviews. So uh, several years ago, we, um, we we've always gotten somehow fans managed to track us down before we were even really on social media. <clears throat> and there would be requests for, you know, can you say happy birthday to my friend? Or I remember one of the um, one of the most lovely ones was a fan in Norway uh, wrote to us and uh, said he wanted us to record his proposal to his fiance. Oh wow! And I didn't see the message because it was in that other messages thing. Yes. In mess. And then I found it like two months later and I wrote back to him and I said, I'm so sorry, we missed this. Um, what can we do? And so he wrote a poem sort of in the writing style of the Wheel of Time. And we recorded that poem and they played it at his wedding in Norway. And that's one of the like strangest effects of this kind of global phenomenon and being known is the idea that our voices are echoing somewhere in a chapel in Norway and someone's getting married and they're listening to <laughs> Amazing. We have a Swami in India who's yeah. a huge fan. <laughs> really? <And so laughs> That's we, awesome. Yeah. So we started thinking, well, we can't really just do this it will consume limitless time. because we yeah. could be doing it all day and then we'll not be able to pay the mortgage, we'll lose the house and we'll be on the street and that wouldn't be good. Um, so we started thinking, well, we can ask people for donations. And because we're in audiobooks and because we love language and because we understand the importance of literacy, the idea of, we'll make a donation to a literacy program came up. And then that gradually sort of got um, funneled towards the idea of prison literacy programs because, and you had a conversation that was interesting uh, with someone about the the key to breaking the cycle. Right, I I was in, in working for the Library of Congress Talking Books program. Um, occasionally, I had been asked to be the voice of God um, at uh, you know uh, uh, events and at the literacy awards uh, that the library has every year. Um, I was the voice of God, and the you know which basically means, ladies and gentlemen, sit down. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, turn your phones off, all that kind of stuff. Or Nothing. I will blast uh, yeah. you. Yeah, the, the <laughs> intercom voice that comes over at the events. Like, everyone, please take your seats. Yeah. The inner storm father comes out. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but but the keynote, the, one of the sponsors and keynote speakers talked about, in order to break the cycle of poverty, you have, it has to start with literacy. Because as a worker... As a as a citizen, if you cannot read, it 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 becomes a huge glass ceiling, very low to the ground, um, in terms of what you are able to do. 
because you can't fill out an employment uh, form. You don't know when there's a want ad. You don't know what kind of contract you're doing. You don't know what kind of banking you're doing. You don't, politically, you, you, you can't read anything. Um, you can't move up in terms of training, you know, other than hands-on training. And even there, it's like it's very limited because someone has to be showing something to you. So the only way you can really break the poverty cycle, one of the first things you need to do is increase the literacy of the population. Um, and that's a proven fact. And so literacy, uh, and the, you know, when I think about one of the, the beautiful gifts of, of being able to read for the talking books uh, for the blind and, and print disabled is I can't imagine what it's like not to be able to read. Um, you know, the crawl on your TV, on your computer, on your phone. It's like, imagine not knowing what that is saying. Um, and so the idea that, okay, uh, we'll, we'll be glad to sing, you know, happy birthday or give you a, a, a phone greeting or whatever, but to make a donation to a program which, you know, aids in breaking that cycle of poverty. And, and we've had any number of people who actually, fans who have come up and said, yeah, I, I first read these books in prison. Um, and that, I, I still remember when we finished The Wheel of Time, the th third comment on Audible was from uh, uh, someone who was dyslexic. And he said, I was 15 or 16 years old when I started uh, I was ready to drop out. I hated school because no one under, you know, everybody thought I was stupid. I was always being shamed, yada, yada, yada. He came across um, the audio book of Wheel of, uh, for Wheel of Time and that he became hooked on the story, which um, like a lot of the fantasy genre is a redemption story. It's coming of age and redemption. And and that story inspired him to like, okay, I'll go back to school. And not only that, I'm going to teach myself to read. And so he went out and he bought the print book and he would hold the print book and listen to the audio book. And that was how he taught himself how to read. And he said, he went from that to, okay, I can do this. I can read now. I'm going to go to college got his degree and he said, I have a degree, I have a career, I have a family, I have a life. And it all came back to audiobooks, being able to, to teach him how to function, um, you know, give him, giving him the skills and the desire and uh, to do that. And that is such a, a, a powerful thing, you know, it, what 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 price redemption? You know, um, it's uh, uh, it's an amazing thing, and to have to be able to give that gift and and those kinds of things, uh, we see that because one of the one of the things that Kate put onto our website is, you know, share your story. How do how do audiobooks affect you? Um, and and you know that that kind of lifting up. Um, and educating and, and, and entertaining. And as the population gets older, that's the other thing about the, the talking books program. You know, as you get older, reading books becomes harder and harder to do physically, but, but you can, you know, listen. And in a way, people say, are you cheating? I'm like, no, you're not cheating. <laughs> Stories were always communicated person to person. Yeah. Orally. Print is like this weird kind of other modern. thing. Yeah. It's very modern. Very modern, like the rotary phone, <laughs> dangerous. Um, <laughs> and, um, but stories have always been communicated, you know, person to person. When, you know, back in the, you know, the late 1800s, early 19, you know, 1900s, serialized newspapers, you know, when stories came out, you know, serialized through the newspaper, it's like some somebody would buy a copy they would go to the corner and 25 people would gather around and that one person would read because they were poor they would read that one paper and that, that person became the way the story got told that's why you know the great you know like the 
Mark Twain and uh, Dickens and all that, they, they're made to be read aloud. Stories are made to be heard, very much like a poet would say, you have to read my poetry out loud. You need to hear, you need to have that sound echoing off your body. All right, I'm getting down. No, no, it's fine. No, it's fine. I, I, I enjoyed it. I just want to make sure we get what, where can people find out more about this initiative? So actually, if you go to our website, um, and there's a page that's labeled Books to Prisoners, and there's a link on that page that will take you to the Books to Prisoners website. Okay. And they have lots of information. There are all kinds of prison literacy programs there's probably one in the local prison nearest you um and uh we picked that one because it's nationwide and a lot of people were asking us well can you just like tell me where to donate so yeah. we ended up picking books to prisoners because it's one of the oldest programs one of the largest and they 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 go to all the states um but certainly there's great value in figuring out you know so what is my local prison yeah and any i mean any literacy program you know um it is like i said it literacy is the building block to break poverty um it's the it's the building block that makes better citizens um uh it, it's just it, it's it, you can't you can't move much farther up the ladder if you don't have that yeah well, I, I uh, actually, oh. NFC in our Twitch chat just shared the link. So I put the link in the Twitch chat. And then I, if you're watching on YouTube, we'll make sure that link is in the description as well for people who want to go find more of that. And I think now we've hit the mm -hmm. point in the conversation where I'm officially calling it the, this is the spoiler warning because we, uh, <gasps> we will now be talking about uh, spoilers for not Rhythm of War. Although I know you, oh. you both have already, you know what happens to that book and we do not. <laughs> um, but, uh, this is, this is the, uh, the section in which we'll start discussing that. So Mark, uh, do you, if you have any questions you want to kick us off on? Oh boy, do I have questions. Um, <laughs> yeah. this first one, given that we're in spoiler territory now, and I can ask this, um, is, is kind of for, for Michael, uh, Travis loved when you were Sadius and oh, you was, would, you're stealing my question. I, I'm, I'm giving it for you. Okay. All right. He would love how you said this kind of like arrogant you know you're sad yeah, you're, oh i cannot the, the, think of sadius without hearing you say dalinar <laughs> so like so condescending in these moments where he's like belittling dalinar and like that that line just did such a good job for me of of really selling that character uh, i don't know where mark is going with this question So where i'm I'll... going with this is he's dead now and so travis will never hear it again but i was wondering if, if you wouldn't mind giving travis one final Dalinar, uh, you know, <laughs> to, to give a final goodbye to, to Sadius. Sadius, okay. Dalinar. <laughs> <laughs> it's so good. No, you know what? What's very funny is um, I actually, you know, I, I didn't talk to Mark about this, but when Odium starts to show up, what's very funny is Odium almost ticks, picks up a lot of like in the way you convey him, like the condescension that Sadius had, right? Like they're both just like, oh, poor little Dalinar, I can't figure out his way. Um, and so it's it's, it's kind of cool to sort of see, I mean, are there are there characters, I'm sure, you know, maybe a bit of a cliche question, you might get a lot, but are there characters in, in uh, Stormlight that you in particular, either of you really enjoy voicing that you find out that this is gonna be a chapter that they're in and you're like, oh man, this is gonna be fun for me to step into this character for a bit? Um, well, anytime there's humor, um, to me, that is, I, I, I adore that. Um, so for me, the, the Kaladin Sill relationship is just so much fun. Um, and there's nothing special necessarily about their voices, but it's just the, the back and forth. It's, it's a bit like, I mean, Lopin, obviously, Rock, obviously, um, uh, Sometimes Teft, he has some some stuff in there as well. Um, I I get to see a little bit because sometimes I've got um, Shalon uh, and um, Radiant and what's the other? Uh, the, vale. The, uh, vale. 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 
Um, so there, and there's some, you know, so there's some barbs tossed there. So, but any of those are 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 great fun. Um, uh, Tara Vangian, I adore Tara Vangian. He's he's you know um, he's your grandfather, you know, going with a little bit of you know uh, Mussolini, you know. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, for the most part, it, what's great about uh, Brandon's work is that he gives you very clear characters. Um, oh, uh, no, that's that's a spoiler I can't do. I can't, yeah, please, I, we have to avoid them. Coming, um, that, there is, um, mm, no, I can't do that either. <laughs> it sounds like there's a character in Rhythm of War you enjoy voicing. Oh, in Rhythm of War, there were, there was there's well there's a favorite, but I cannot get I'm not okay. gonna give that away because it's important. Um, sure. Um, and and uh, all I will say is that if you need to be a bit of a Cosmere fan to figure out where this character actually Ooh. comes from, of course, wit, um, wit is is um, and actually there's a a beautiful chapter um, with wit. That is, um, I think Brandon said, I think it was his favorite, uh, favorite chapter that he wrote. Um, and it's, it's, it's really a gorgeous part of the book. Um, oh, I'm, I'm book, excited. Uh, on, this, on that, sorry, go ahead. No, th this, uh, this book is very special. I think people are going to really, this, this book, um, there are parts of this book, uh, and, and there are themes in this book which are, yeah, there's that, but it's just for our time. Yep. Um, it, it it it's going to find a deep resonance within people. I think. Yeah. Um, uh, th that it's was like it. It's like leveling. It's like leveling up in a different kind of way. So. So normally, you know, in this battle of good versus evil, it's all about armor. It's all about ammunition. It's all about warfare. And one of the things that we as human beings have to learn how to do is to walk softly through the world. And that involves self-awareness and self-knowledge and compassion for other people. I can't I think... say anything else because yeah. that would be a major spoiler. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, you guys are both exciting me and terrifying me as as we're yeah. going through this. Um, really, Mark, I know you have a question, but really quickly, Kate, I just want to hear if there are any characters for you that you really enjoy voicing in in this series in particular, or if there are any that you get excited to to voice. Absolutely. I mean, um, from a technical standpoint, it's always very challenging when I get a character that Michael has already voiced and I'm like, what's that voice? And he does it. And I'm like, that's in the basement. I can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> but the, but the, I can do my version of it once I understand like the point of view of the character. And so that's always really fascinating. And I love, I love I love battle voices. I love the voices of people who are really intense and who are like, you're on the edge of the cliff and someone's about to go over and you're like, hold on, you know, you're just like, ah. I love that. I love the intensity and the, and the, I love rage. Um, I love all of those really intense things. But one of the things about the Stormlight Archive that's been interesting for me is because I felt very kind of shut out by Michael's relationship with Brandon. So <laughs> one thing, and I was like, part of it, felt very neglected and jealous. It was like he had a mistress or something. And, and, and then sort of coming into the Stormlight Archives and the women kind of expanding and becoming more rich and resonant and the journeys that they take. Yeah. And... And I'm aging, so where I might have related more with, say, Shalon at one point, I, now I'm like, man, Navani is where yeah. it's at. Um, and the other thing I love is the creatures. I mean, the opportunity to voice a pattern. <laughs> yes. yes. Mm -hmm. That is so imaginative. It's so theatrical. It's mm -hmm. so... 
it's so untethered to reality and it's an invitation to sort of enter into an imagined reality, mm -hmm. which basically is all an encouraging way of saying, if you hate your reality, don't worry, you're not stuck. Look, you can just use your imagination and you can like tweak it yeah. and get out of it. And I love that. Mark, I know you said, or you were, you've been waiting to ask the question. Well, it was kind of related to a lot of what they're saying about the emotional core of it, uh, of especially the Stormlight Archive, because I've, I've heard it described as a self-help book series uh, masquerading as a fantasy novel and stuff. And I, I think that's actually such a, a great way to describe it because so many of what you're saying about like these level ups are characters coming to terms with themselves. And that's, you know, what a lot of the ideals are. And like Tef's whole thing about like, I'll protect those I hate, even if the one I hate is myself. Like some of those just hit so hard. When you guys are recording this, like how in your own head are the, like the idea that these lines are going to be repeated by to, by people and that this is the emotional hit of the of the story and i know you guys read them ahead of time before you record but like do you ever start feeling like the empathy with these characters as you're narrating um <laughs> <laughs> you end the scene and have to wipe your eyes no i, I mean that it, it you have to yeah you have to um yeah, there are times, and and the, a lot of the, the the technical difficulty is there's prose along with the dialogue, mm -hmm. and the prose isn't in the same world um, as the dialogue, and so you're you know developing that facility to go from one to to keep that emotional boil going without having it spill over into a, snot. Uh, well, uh, that that's. <laughs> going to be readily apparent in a, a section of narrative right. um, is really challenging. Um, but yeah, you have to, you have to. And, and, and that's the, the insight that you gain when you're in that state. Um, that's when you also begin to feel how true the line is um, so that whether it's a Sadius line or whatever, you know, when you're in that emotional state, the line will ring true, uh, whatever the state may be, uh, it's, whether it's weakness or uh, or exaltation or uh, you know arrogance. That always, if you're not in that state to a certain degree emotionally, you're you you won't find the nuance of the line. And and the and the I think the the technical challenge, which is also an emotional challenge, is um, as the as the voice piece or the actor. If you are if you are weeping, then the audience is not being brought to that state then they're just watching you weep. So the challenge as a performer, whether you're on stage or recording audiobooks, is to deliver them, the listener, the audience member, into that state where they experience the emotion. So it's a, it's a multi-fragmented, crazy-making thing that's going on in the brain. Because on the one hand, you're like, oh my God, this is it, I'm crying. And on the other hand, you're like, I am technically proficient and I'm switching from narrator voice to <laughs> right. yes. voice yeah. back again. And then there's a third part that is also going, am I serving the story? Am I, am I delivering this in a way that is going to put the listener into that spot that the author wants them to be in? Mm -hmm. So it's fun. Yeah. yeah. Hey, just to, uh, we, uh, to bring us back from some of these uh, very high level discussions, what more basic one, how long does it take you guys to record a book like this? Because obviously you can tell that there's X number of hours in it, but obviously there's way more work that goes into it. Maybe you're pausing. I don't know if you have to repeat, but what, what is, how long does it actually take? So the standard is uh, two to three hours in the booth for one hour of produced audio. If you're yeah. really cooking, you can do an hour in an hour and a half to two hours. Gotcha. And, and, and what about 
Um, that doesn't count. Reading the book ahead right. of time research. or doing all of the research to figure out the um, pronunciations and understanding the story. Right. And with a hard book that can be, there was one, when I was doing a book on Raul Julia, or Raul Julia, Raul Wallenberg, um, I was getting one hour for every five hours, um, just because when you're flipping languages, when you're going from Russian to German to Hungarian, to Norway, to English, to Italian, um, to French, um, you look at a word and it's like, what vowel system am I using for this? Uh, <laughs> freeze up. Um, <laughs> Um, uh, with, with Rhythm of War, we would have, a, a well, there was the pre-read, um, but then we would have a daily meeting, uh, every, every day where we would go over the sections that we expected to record that day and make sure that we were on the same page with both what we were going to do, but also to make sure that, um, what Our we, team. Well, that everybody on the team was on the same page because in some cases, some characters are, or some names anyway, we're referring back two and three volumes, and it's been five or six years since um, we've done that. And, and just to have, you know, what's that voice sound like? And the team that Macmillan put awesome. together um, was whew, through, yeah. through the roof fantastic uh, in terms of the support. We have a question, and, and within hours, if not minutes, there would be a response on. And that's also Brandon's team that he has working with him in terms of nailing down things um, and and just to keep it moving smoothly. But we would have an hour to two hour meeting every every day before we would kind of start our recording sessions and then chart out what we wanted to do. We we chronicled this yeah. on uh, like Instagram and Twitter and our Facebook page. Yeah. And <laughs> like everything else, it's like, oh, how did you end up here? So on, on the, the day that we started recording, Peter Alstrom posted a picture that was this big fat stack of printed pages, pages, right? Like a big yeah, honking yeah. great thing. Okay, like this. <laughs> <laughs> um, and with something like, you know, um, it, it begins, yes. or it's finally written. Yeah. And so I was like, oh, great. And so I retweeted that. And I was like, here we go. You won't hear from us in a while. And then we finished recording that day and I was like, well, I kind of have to post an update. And so I posted a picture of the two of us going like, end of the first day, we're up to page, blah, blah, blah. And then that turned into, because we did it in what, 18 days? 18 days. It turned With into, every, oh yeah. We, we like had a picture and an update, sort of we said, we're up to page, blah, blah. There was a flood. We got in Hyattsville, Maryland, which is where we live. We were the epicenter of rainfall for this incredible deluge. We got six inches in an hour. <laughs> oh my oh. God. That was the first time since we built our studio that yeah. air water came in. Yeah. So it was like, storm father. <laughs> 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 It, yeah. yeah, I mean, that was that was an incredible, we knew how huge the project was going in and we knew how important communication would be. Yeah. Normally, it's not it's not that big of a deal, yeah. but this was yeah. big. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think we were getting, you would post something and within 20 minutes there would be, you know, 50 responses already yeah. to what was going on when when we posted a picture of like water on the studio yeah. floor and yeah. i was like yeah michael went out to get a wet vac yeah. he's been dying to buy one for years yeah. <laughs> there were people in our area really? who were messaging us yeah. saying i have a wet vac i can be there in 30 minutes <laughs> tell me if you need me <laughs> that's incredible yeah. um wow okay so we have a couple of questions from twitch chat here at the end of the the panel so the first one comes from Aro Man, who says, "Any chance we see or hear a cameo from either of you in the Wheel of Times Wheel of Time TV series?" Ask them to cast us. <laughs> yeah. At this point, at this point, we haven't heard anything from them. Okay. Um, so, petition, petition. Yeah, that's not to say we wouldn't be willing to do something. We would love to. Um, <laughs> but 
they have not approached us at all. Okay. Uh, and that's, yeah. Um, let's see. So where, where else are we in here? Oh, uh, cannot have my pain says, do you both hope to narrate the entire Stormlight archive? We might be dead by the time it's finished. Let's hope not, but um, <laughs> we yeah. would love to. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I, you know, it's, it's, you know, when you work with an author after a while, you get, you, you're very aware of syntax and, and it just becomes your, you know, the, the kind of, oh, with this author, I do this, or he does this, or she does that. Um, and for myself, just because I've done, you know, seven, or six Mistborn books already, plus this, plus the three Wheel of Time, plus Rhythmatist, plus Warbreaker. Um, I feel like, yeah, I, you know, actually I'm very glad that other narrators are doing other series because that's always, a, 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 to a certain degree, a burden in a way you feel like um, to be the only voice of that particular author is not necessarily um, fair, uh, you know, a, uh, this may sound unbelievable, but it's like the, what we really try to do is disappear yeah. um, so that you're really aware of the story um, and you're not so much. I mean, yeah, we're doing that work, but in a way it's like you're, you're seeing the story, you're hearing the story, you're imagining the story through the window of our voice, which hopefully is as clear a glass as we can make it. Um, but your series become kind of like your children, and yeah. it's like you try to take my child, I will cut you. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah uh, and there's oh, there's ahead. so much insight and insight you know because you you've been oh this line this line goes back to chapter three of that book. Wow, who's going to get that? Well, somebody will obviously because these the. the the fans around both the Wheel of Time and the Stormlight Archive are uh, great, and they are intense, and I under I can understand that. Um, uh, we work in live theater as well, um, and one of the things that I think we both kind of discovered was that the power of people seeing themselves on stage is electrifying for them. And it's what makes you be as honest as you can, because that is that person's reality. Right. That's their truth. And you need to serve that truth with as much dignity as you can. And there are times when you are incredibly weak on stage, and yet there are people, that's me. That's me. And for them, you know, it, it's, it's a bit like, I'm sure that there are tons of young African-American women right now that are looking at the vice president elect and going, that's me, that can be me. That both a role model, but also just identity can be so, so critically important. Um, so it's, it's, uh, it's both a burden, but also it's like, it's, it's, it also motivates you, yes, there's a reason. And when the writing is such that it, uh, no, uh, uh, <laughs> uh, um, yeah, this, this is, like I say, this book is going to be um, a real revelation, I think, to a lot of people. Uh, I think maybe, maybe our last question, because I know we're, we're running low on time, but, you know, we're, Mark and I are both gamers, uh, and this channel kind of explores the world between video games and sci-fi fantasy. The so standard bearer asks, uh, do Kate and Michael play any games? And if so, uh, are there any that have your attention? So any video games? I don't know if either of you, you delve into video games at all. So our son is a great gamer, Henry Kramer. Um, and uh, I do not, I have never, I, it, no, overwhelming. Rolls, <laughs> 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 too much stimulation. Mm -hmm. Um. I'm a Civilization fan. Oh, you share that with Brandon? Um, yeah, well, it's partly the world building thing. It's also, it just makes you think about, okay, how do you construct a, a society, and, you know, keeping everything in balance? Um, that's kind of uh, the thing, but that that's, 
just because it's it's not just you know how many um, health points have I lost by getting hit here or you know do I gain by getting that thing or whatever um, so yeah that's that's and the fascinating thing yeah. about gaming is the genres of literature that have arisen completely from the yeah. whole video game experience. So yeah. we have recently had an experience recording RPG lit. Yeah. Oh yeah. Which yeah. is a brand new genre. It didn't yeah. exist before. Yeah. yeah. And it's great, you know, but all of a sudden you're like cut to the fourth wall, bonus points. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> you know, I mean, <laughs> Uh, have either of you been ever approached to do any voice work for video games ask, or have you yeah. done done any voice work for video games? I way back when about oh my, 10 years ago. Yeah. I think it was I think the, I think the name of the game was Ultimate 2 or something like that. Mm. I I I did like oh like five different voices and they were the the texts were like that's the same guy and I was like yeah. Uh, um <laughs> That it's it's hard work in that um, you can be burned out in the sense of okay, give me twenty different deaths, you know, you know, screams of hits, you know, yeah. because of, you know, um, uh. and all of a sudden, you know, after half an hour of being killed, and you know, oh, oh, oh you know, it's like <laughs> your voice goes. But um, no, I mean that's a uh, we, yeah. we often run into an issue with our union membership. So we're members of SAG-AFTRA. And there are a lot of video game companies when they hire voiceover people, they actually prefer to hire non-union because they don't want to deal yeah, with Yeah, it's a big discussion yeah. right now in the yeah. space. So that yeah, makes sense. Um, yeah. This is a total tangent, uh, but in, in our industry, especially esports, you have, you know, people who are uh, commentators like in traditional sports you know the people who are kind of narrating the, the plays going on uh -huh. and like i wonder if like i would love to have a crossover at some point where we could like transcribe one of their their iconic calls because that, that's often what the commentators in, in our space get known for is some insane play happens and they're losing their minds over top of it but i would love to hear you know Kate and Michael doing a narration of this play or something like it would just be so so funny to have this iconic uh, you won't know who this is but this iconic double if play or something yeah. like that I think it would be incredible yeah well either way I, the, oh, oh, go ahead one of the things I ever saw you know the Edinburgh Fringe Festival is like a, a, a indie theater festival that happens every year there's the the big stuff on the main stage and then the whole city is flooded with tiny performance right. spaces and things. Like and living. I just remember this comedian doing this thing that was basically Sean Connery doing anything. So one of the most hilarious moments was Sean Connery making toast. <laughs> I feel like <laughs> I feel like there's some aspect of like anybody's life. Just narrate it. Just just like get a good microphone and narrate it. You know, Josh got up. <laughs> well, I want to thank uh, both of you so much for your time uh, chatting with us today. We're really excited to to dive into this. In fact, uh, for anybody on stream, uh, Mark and I are going to, we got permission to listen to the first chapter of the audiobook, And so we'll be doing that uh, very shortly. But thank you so much. Is there anything either of you would like to say um, you know, before we close out the conversation to any of the fans out there? Just, you know, it's wonderful to be part of a community that values stories. It is so rewarding. It is so enjoyable. It gives me hope that people can come together. Yeah, and, and as we've said, this, you know, this is going to be a very special book, and so enjoy it. Yeah. Very excited. Uh, thank you so much for your Thanks, time. Dude. Oh, yeah. yeah. And, uh, and hope you have a good rest of your day.